I don't know what comes next, but I don't regret any of this. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 teen movie moments that made us ugly cry. The doctor said I should go on and live life normally as, as best I could. I, I don't want anybody to be weird around me. Including me? Especially you. For this list, we'll be looking at the most emotional scenes in the adolescent film canon that make us burst into tears of all kinds, be it happy, sad, or anything in between. Watch out for teary spoilers ahead. Did we miss any of your favorite cry fests? Let us know in the comments. Number 20, reading aloud, Freedom Writers. Her tears hit my shirt like bullets and told me we were being evicted. She kept apologizing to me. I thought I have no home. I should have asked for something less expensive at Christmas. Sometimes all it takes is one kid speaking up. Freedom Writers is based on the true story of Erin Gruwell, an English teacher who had her students keep diaries about the hardships in their lives. In one moving scene, a kid who hasn't really spoken up before asks Miss Gruwell if he can read from his diary. He tells a story of how he and his mother were evicted from their home, the experience so traumatic that he didn't feel like returning to school was worth it. But then, stepping into Miss Gruwell's English class, he was reminded that he does have a place where he belongs. The first teacher is Mrs. Gruwell in room 203. I walk into the room and feel as though all the problems in life are not so important anymore. I am home. The scene is a touching reminder of the effect that a good teacher can have on someone. Number 19, Mom's Wisdom, Love, Simon. You said, Mom, I'm still me. I need you to hear this. You are still you, Simon. Leave it to mom to bring out the waterworks. Love, Simon is about a closeted high schooler who struggles to come out to his loved ones. Unfortunately, the choice to come out to most of his friends is taken away from him. This also forces him to come out to his parents before he's necessarily ready. While the initial conversation doesn't go quite as well as planned, Simon is later able to speak with both of his parents separately. And the conversation with his mother? Well, let's just say it breaks our hearts in the best way possible. But you get to exhale now, Simon. You get to be more you than you have been in, in a very long time. Played by the lovely Jennifer Garner, she skewers to the center of what her son is experiencing in only the way a maternal figure can. Number 18, We Are Infinite, The Perks of Being a Wallflower. I know these will all be stories someday, and our pictures will become old photographs. We'll all become somebody's mom or dad. But right now, these moments are not stories. This is happening. The Perks of Being a Wallflower follows the ups and downs of friendship between three friends, Charlie, Sam, and Patrick. It deals with a lot of really heavy themes that can be difficult to watch, but somehow ends in a place that feels positive. At the end of the film, the trio drive through a tunnel while listening to David Bowie's song Heroes, something they've done before. As the wind whips up against Charlie's face, he speaks three triumphant words in a callback moment that always gets us. We are infinite. Everything these three have been through has been so tough. It's hard not to cry through your smile as you watch. Number 17, Alike's poem, Pariah. Dealing with your sexuality when you're a teenager is difficult enough as it is, but feeling forced into making a decision between yourself and your family because of it is even worse. Pariah follows a 17-year-old named Alike as she begins to accept that she's a lesbian. However, her mother, and to a lesser extent her father, have a more difficult time coming to grips with this truth about their daughter. You tell your mother that's not true. You already know. No, I don't know. You tell your mom it's just a phase. It's not a phase. See, you should have done something. You should have done something. You? There's nothing wrong with this me. After a confrontation with her mom turns violent, Alike decides to move to California. As the film comes to an end, she shares a poem that says she is not running, but rather choosing. It's a beautiful moment of self-acceptance and one that leaves us weepy to this day. I am choosing. 
Running is not a choice from the breaking. Breaking is freeing. Number 16, Maria Loses Tony, West Side Story. I didn't believe hard enough. Loving is enough. Not here. Let us be. It's not quite the original teen romance, but it's very close. West Side Story is based on William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. It follows the love story between Maria and Tony, who both fall on opposite sides of a gang conflict in 1950s New York City. The two try to make their love work, but family and violence get between them. The musical ends with Tony's death, another casualty of a pointless, ongoing war. After he dies, Maria delivers a stirring speech about the toxic power of hate. You all killed him, and my brother, and Riff. Not with bullets and guns, with hate. Well, I can kill too, because now I have hate. As everyone looks on, she finally breaks down, unable to handle the tragic truth of what's occurred. We're right there with her. Number 15, Sutter Rejects Amy, The Spectacular Now. Did you hear me? Yeah. Sutter, I love you. No, you don't. Yes, I do. No, you don't, you're wrong. The Spectacular Now is one of the most criminally underrated teen movies of the past decade. It's warm, funny, and has more than a few scenes that are sure to make you cry. It follows the romance between Amy and Sutter. After a trip to see Sutter's neglectful father goes wrong, he takes out his frustrations on Amy during the ride home. Don't love me. Yes, I do. You're wrong, you don't love me. Okay, you're just drunk and you're grateful that somebody came along and showed interest in you. Okay, stop. Stop, do not try and mess this up. He claims she's lying when she says she loves him and makes her exit his car, saying he's not good for her. When she steps out in the middle of the road, an oncoming vehicle hits her. Amy ends up all right, but the scene is so emotionally fraught, it's hard not to be affected. Number 14, why Brian is in detention, The Breakfast Club. The Breakfast Club is one of the most beloved teen movies of all time, but there's so much joy and fun to be had, it's easy to forget some of the heavier themes it contains. Yet there's plenty of content to make you ugly cry, with one revelation from the shy Brian in particular standing out. While the teens are talking about how they ended up in detention, Brian reveals that he brought a weapon to school, intending to end his own life. Mr. Ryan found a gun in the locker. Why'd you have a gun in your locker? I tried. He feels immense pressure to do well academically because of his parents, but this attempt barely even registered on their radars. It's a haunting moment, and actor Anthony Michael Hall handles it with great care. Number 13, Charlie's Flashbacks, The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Throughout 2012's The Perks of Being a Wallflower, there are hints that something is going on beneath the surface with the main character, Charlie. We know from the jump that he lives with depression, and we're given a few clues regarding the details. Still, it never feels like we have the full story. That changes at the tail end of the film. During a harrowing and confusing sequence, we learn that Charlie was previously abused by his Aunt Helen, something he had suppressed. I killed Aunt Helen, didn't I? She died getting my birthday present, so I guess I killed her, right? I've tried to stop thinking that, but I can't. The scene that reveals this information is extremely disorienting and tragic, anchored by a very strong performance from actor Logan Lerman. Watching Charlie struggle with the flashbacks and eventually understand and remember what happened to him is almost impossible to bear. Stop crying. <laughs> Number 12, The Hospital Scene, The Last Song. I didn't lie. Yes, you did, Dad. You said you were fine. You're not fine. I didn't that lie. was a lie. I hoped. I didn't lie. It's not the same thing. The last song hinges on a few mysteries, like who started the church fire, and most importantly, why did Jonah and Ronnie's dad suddenly decide that he had to spend the summer with his kids? Among all the answers we get, the one to the last question is the most gut-wrenching. After Ronnie's dad collapses, we learn that he has terminal cancer and has been keeping it from his children. Why didn't you tell us? It's not what I wanted this 
time to be about. Well, it is. It is now, Daddy. Oh, it's not. Ronnie confronts him, and the scene that unfolds between them is striking in every way. There's righteous anger on her part, but there's also so much love and reconciliation. It's heart-wrenchingly beautiful to behold, and makes their final moments together later on all the more impactful. Number 11. Isaac's Eulogy – The Fault in Our Stars In The Fault in Our Stars, Isaac is the character who delivers a lot of necessary comedic relief. And when your plot revolves around two kids with cancer falling in love, that humor is necessary. But even he gets his moment to make us weep uncontrollably. He only got 19 years when he should have gotten way more. 18 years, buddy. Dude, come on. Really? I'm assuming you have a little more time, you interrupting bastard. You interrupt me in the middle of my eulogy. You're supposed to be dead. <laughs> when Gus is coming to grips with the fact that he'll die soon, he asks for a pre-funeral to be held so that he can attend. During the event, Isaac gives a eulogy for Gus. As you might expect, the speech is filled with jokes and zingers galore. He makes sure to make us laugh at first, but our giggles promptly dissolve into tears when he gets to the end of his speech. Gus, I don't even want to see a world without you. I don't. I don't want to see a world without Augustus Waters. Number 10. The Airport – Lady Bird there aren't a lot of teen movies out there that so heavily feature the relationship between a mother and a daughter. The only exciting thing about 2002 is that it's a palindrome. Okay, fine. Well, yours is the worst life of all, so you win. Oh, so now you're mad. No, it's because just you're I being ridiculous because you have a great life. I'm so Lady Bird handles the complexities that come with that bond with equal parts seriousness and humor. And there's one scene in particular that wrecks us whenever we watch it. Upset that Lady Bird is going to college in New York, her mother Marion initially doesn't get out of the car to say bye to her at the airport. You're not coming. You can't walk up to the gates anymore anyway. Yeah, but I'm going to college. Well, Dad will walk you to security. She then becomes emotional after driving off and returns to make things right. But Lady Bird has already left. Lori Metcalf, who plays Marion, is wonderful in the scene pouring her emotion through the screen right into the audience. Number 9. OK, Hazel Grace? The Fault in Our Stars A lot of movies have taglines, but most of them don't turn us into blubbering messes at the drop of a hat. In The Fault in Our Stars, Gus and Hazel Grace have a simple rapport between them, and every time they say OK to each other, it renders us speechless. Are you in pain? No. I'm OK. But there's no more soul-stirring use of the OK turn of phrase than in Gus's letter to Hazel. After his funeral, it's revealed that he left a eulogy for Hazel to read following his passing. In it, he expresses his love for her and the fact that he has accepted his death, helping her to begin moving on too. Everything might not be OK now, but thanks to this moment, we know it will be. And I like my choices. I hope she likes hers. Okay, Hazel Grace? Okay. Number 8. Jamie's Confession – A Walk to Remember A Walk to Remember follows the burgeoning friendship and subsequent romance between bad boy Landon and the religious Jamie. When the two first start hanging out, she tells him that whatever happens, he cannot develop feelings for her. One condition, though, Carter. What's that? You have to promise you won't fall in love with me. That's not a problem. He scoffs at the assertion, but of course he falls for her, and the feeling is mutual. That's what makes it extra heartbreaking for everyone involved when she reveals she has leukemia, and that the doctors don't think she'll get better. No. You're, eight, you're 18. You're, you're, you're perfect. No, no. I found out two years ago, and I've stopped responding to treatments. There's so much at stake, and it's such an intense, charged revelation, so it's no wonder the scene always reduces us to tears. Still, we're happy Landon didn't take Jamie's initial advice, because their love story is one for the books. But our love is like the wind. I can't see it, but I can feel it. Number 7. The Poem – 10 Things I Hate About You 
Some might say, compared to other things that happen in teen movies, a poem about a boy doesn't matter much in the grand scheme of things. But we strongly disagree when it comes to this particular poem and this particular delivery from actress Julia Stiles. It leaves us awestruck and weepy every time. I hate the way you're always right. I hate it when you lie. I hate it when you make me laugh. Even worse, when you make me cry. After learning that her love interest Patrick initially only dated her because he was paid to do so, Kat is heartbroken. So she writes about him for a class assignment that she then reads in front of everyone, including him. Her words are poignant and extremely relatable. I hate it when you're not around and the fact that you didn't call. But mostly I hate the way I don't hate you. Not even close. Not even a little bit. Not even at all. Most people have felt how Kat does in this moment, and it's hard not to get choked up alongside her. Number 6. Juno's Note Juno There's plenty of trash men in movies. Like Jason Bateman's character in Juno, he's Mark Loring, one half of a married couple who plans to adopt teen Juno's child. He and Juno have lots in common, and at first everything seems innocent. But later, he reveals that he has feelings for the teen and plans to leave his wife Vanessa. This is something I've been wanting to do for a long time. No. No? No, you definitely can't do that. That's one big fat sack of... No. This is hideously inappropriate and gross, and also puts Juno through the ringer. Though she leaves the Loring's house in anger, she later returns to drop off a note. We're unsure of what exactly it says until the end, when we see that Vanessa, ready to be a single mom, has framed it. If you're still in, I'm still in. Cue the tears. Hello. Is this, am I? How do I look? Like a new mom. Number 5. A Difficult Conversation – Pretty in Pink You might remember Pretty in Pink as a frothy, flirty teen movie, featuring actors like Molly Ringwald, John Cryer, and Andrew McCarthy. You can't get more 80s fun than that. But there's a lot more to it. One storyline in particular gets us crying no matter how many rewatches it's been. Ringwald is Andy, a teenager whose mother left her and her father Jack, something that he's still reeling from. Sure, you go through it every day. You're still going through it. Why can't you just realize that she's gone and she's not going to come back? She's never coming back. Shut you up! It? Shut Why it. can't you accept it? In a gripping scene, she confronts her dad, played by Harry Dean Stanton, about his inability to let her mom go. Over the course of the scene, Andy speaks some pretty difficult truths to Jack with both Ringwald and Stanton delivering compelling and emotionally sound performances. She left us, Daddy. We didn't leave her. There was nothing we could do about it. It just happened. Since when's a daughter supposed to know more than her father? Number 4. Will's Farewell – Five Feet Apart Could you close your eyes? I just don't know if I can walk away if you're still looking. Five Feet Apart is a movie that's basically designed to rip your heart in half. It follows a developing romance between Stella and Will, two teens who have cystic fibrosis. Because of the severity of their vulnerabilities, they're not allowed to get closer than six feet to one another. Of course, the love between them, along with other circumstances, causes them to break the rule. At the end of the film, while she's recovering from surgery, he makes the decision to end their relationship so as not to risk infecting her. All I want is to be with you. I can't. I need you to be safe. From me. Before he goes, he leaves her a sketchbook that depicts memories of their time together. It's incredibly difficult to watch. We know it's what must be done, but it hurts. Number 3. Do I Make You Sad? 8th Grade Middle school can be one of the worst, most difficult times in a young person's life. Thank goodness for those, like parents, who are there through the hard stuff. After a slew of anxiety-inducing and, in some cases, downright scary events in her life, 8th grader Kayla uncovers a time capsule she made for herself a few years prior. She decides to burn it and enlists her father's help. As they get to work, she asks a devastating question. Do I make you sad? What? No. No, not at all. Not at all. What, why, do I seem sad? 
The quiver of her voice alone is enough to bring on the waterworks, but her dad's amazing response is what really sets us over the edge. If you grow up to have a daughter like you, she will make you so, so happy. I, being your dad makes me so happy, Kayla. You don't know, I, you don't know. It's exactly what we all needed to hear. Number two, you are not your father. The Spectacular Now. I drove up there last week and I saw him. You're right, Mom. Sutter. You're right the whole time. You are not your father. When you're young, it can be hard to separate the good from the bad when it comes to parents or guardians. It can be easy to idolize the one who's in the wrong while vilifying the other for all kinds of reasons. That's what makes this scene from The Spectacular Now so powerful. After a disastrous meeting with his absentee father, Sutter struggles and spirals, and he becomes racked with the fear that he might turn out like his dad. He takes that anger out on his mother, who comforts him and helps him realize that couldn't be further from the truth. That man has never loved anyone but himself. His heart is this big. You love everybody. You have the biggest heart of anyone I know. The scene is deeply moving and is further bolstered by incredible performances from Jennifer Jason Lee and Miles Teller. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, the fireplace. Call me by your name. Leave it to Timothy Chalamet to turn us into puddles on the floor without saying a word. Call me by your name is filled with a plethora of moments that hit us straight in the feels. Oh, you're getting married? I suppose. I might be getting married next spring. Yeah. Mr. Perlman's wonderful speech about love and pain comes to mind, but the scene that unfolds at the film's conclusion will always stand out from the rest. There's sorrow, pain. Don't kill it. I'm with it, the joy you felt. Right after Oliver has called Elio and told him that he's getting married soon, the latter takes a seat in front of the fireplace. The camera frames his face, and he begins to silently weep. We watch his expression run the gamut of emotions, sending our hearts on a roller coaster of emotion as well. agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.